The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast, featuring interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. They've got the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficial insects that help to control them. This podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Today's guest on the Pest and Predator podcast is Dr. Carol Frost. She's assistant professor in the Department of Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta, and we're talking spiders. Carol, welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to today's topic. We haven't chatted about spiders yet on the Pest and Predator podcast. And I guess keeping it simple right up the start, are, are, are spiders insects? No, they're not. They're related in that all of them have an exoskeleton, uh, which means unlike we have an internal skeleton and a backbone, they have their hard parts on the outside. So in that way, they're related to insects, but they're actually in a different class called arachnida. And spiders have eight legs, and they don't have wings, whereas insects have six legs, and they usually have wings. Wow. I, I have to ask you, how, how did you get into this field? Like, what was the interest in spiders? Oh, well, I really loved insects and spiders from a young age. And this was partly thanks to when I was young, we had a lot of class pets which were insects and so I watched them a lot and just they're so different from vertebrates and from other animals that I just got intrigued and then I studied them in university and I found out about the huge diversity of them there are just so many species there are as many species of spiders as there are of all vertebrates and when you think about most vertebrates being fish it's just an incredible number of spiders there are actually there are 50,000 described species of spiders as of this year and there are probably double that really existing because most of them aren't described and they're incredibly common right yeah yeah that's right they're they're really everywhere um an estimate an estimate from 97 1973 counted an overall mean density of 131 spiders per meter squared uh which is an average over the whole globe of course in some ecosystems you'll have more than others but but that's a lot of spiders per meter squared on average (laughs) and in grasslands, it's also been estimated that there are 152 spiders per meter squared. So when you think about it, that's an incredible number. If any of the audience has arachnophobia, they've, they've just, they're <laughs> squirming. Oh, well, most of these are really small. They live really close to the soil and you, you won't encounter many of them. So spiders are pretty good at hiding. <laughs> We're not talking about black widows in terms of that density. Okay, so no. <laughs> how much do spiders eat? Well, this actually has been estimated. And of course, estimates when you think on the global scale are always uh, somewhat inaccurate. But the best estimate is that on a global context, over all terrestrial ecosystems, spiders consume in the range of 400 to 800 million tons of prey per year. And that's really hard to picture. What does that actually mean? But for comparison, the human population was estimated to consume an um, to consume the same 400 million tons of meat and fish annually. And that, yeah, that was estimated for 2014. So, so we humans eat as much meat as all the global spiders eat in a year. And um, similarly, prey by by whales in the world oceans has been estimated to be in the same range, 280 to 500 million tons. So spiders as a group consume a huge amount, even though they're, they're so small and they're, they're consuming, each one is only consuming about 10% of its body weight. Um, but, but when you, when you multiply that across how many spiders there are per meter squared, it's really a huge amount of food consumption. That, that yeah, no kidding. Um, so that that's a lot of consumption when you talk to 400 to 800 million tons what are they eating yeah. well they they eat pretty much everything actually they eat flies true bugs ants bees wasps small soil critter, critters that we we don't usually see like springtails and mites they eat beetles butterflies moths grasshoppers and they they're even cannibalistic they even eat other spiders and for some 
for some spider species, they actually try to eat only other spiders. <laughs> so it, it's really variable. Some of the bigger spiders in tropical places even eat small vertebrates like fish or frogs. So we don't have that so much here. Although we do have a really big fishing spider that, that can eat fish. And, and so for, and I, I know this is like a really broad question, but for a specific type of spider, it, is the is the their targeted diet is it very like a narrow band or is it you know is it quite wide across all the different species and i know that's a very broad question but just how yeah, tight is no, that band but it's it's not very tight compared to other natural enemies that we typically talk about especially since we're talking today about um, natural enemies in crops but compared to the other natural enemies you can find in crops spiders are some of the most generalist and um, although there, there is some specialization, like I just said, some spiders try to eat other spiders, but those are much more in tropical areas than temperate areas where we are. And um, especially the kind of spider that builds a web to catch prey, not all spiders do that. Some run around the ground and just ambush prey uh, um, or hunt prey actively. Uh, so those ones um, eat other spiders more than the ones that, that build webs. So um, yeah, I guess most of them are really generalist, and the one thing that makes them great natural enemies for um, that results from that is that if there's a kind of insect in the environment that becomes really abundant, like a pest, spiders are great at switching and focusing on that species. So they're really great at um, taking advantage of any insect prey species that's really abundant in the environment. So based on the information we've talked about so far, how does this apply in our fields? Well, um, yeah, so I guess we said that it's useful that they're generalists because they switch and eat whatever kind of herbivorous species is most abundant. Um, I said at the beginning that there are tons of spiders, spider density is really high. Actually, spider density in crops is considerably lower than the average spider densities uh, in a grassland, for example, or a forest because crops have such a high amount of disturbance. So when we harvest the crop, Lots of spiders live up in the foliage rather than on the ground, and for those, they they sort of disappear. Uh, they find that it's not good habitat year after year, and they don't stay if if a crop gets harvested. So, um, globally estimated, uh, a global estimate for the standing biomass of spiders in annual crops that get harvested every year is 17 milligrams per meter squared. Which that, I know that's hard to picture. What is that in number of spiders? But but if you compare that to the estimated biomass of spiders in grasslands, the estimate for crops was 17. The estimate for grasslands is 160 milligrams per meter squared. So it's way higher. It's, it's 10 times higher in grasslands. So, so this does suggest that if we were able to do things that made, less, made crops a better habitat for spiders, we could get way higher spider biomasses in crops, which would be very useful because they eat so much. And because they're capable at living at such high densities in natural habitat and crops. Another thing that's useful about having spiders in crops is that um, even though some spiders eat each other, experiments and, and field studies have shown that when you have spiders there versus when you eliminate them or, or in cage experiments where you exclude them all and then, and then like remove all the spiders and put a cage and, and monitor herbivory, um, there's always less herbivorous, like spiders as a community um, do a good job of controlling pests. The, and estimates range from, they reduce herbivorous insect populations by 1 to 20%. So in some cases it's low, but where you have a lot of spiders, it can be up to 20%. So it's, it's a lot of uh, reduction in herbivory. And the other thing is that they're great at doing early season um, consuming of herbivores, where, whereas some of the other more specialized natural enemies Take, take a while for their populations to build up. The spiders are eating right right from the spring. So how do spiders get into the fields? What's, what's that activity and path look like? Well, actually, despite the fact that I said that there are very few spiders in fields, they, they do have an enormous capacity to colonize fields, aerially, actually, via ballooning. So very many species of spiders can travel long distances by flight, even though they don't have wings. And the way that they do that is they stand on a high piece of vegetation and release silk threads out of their spinnerets, 
And they, they're usually triggered to do this behaviorally by weather conditions. If it's sort of sunny with a light breeze, they exhibit this behavior. And then when, when they've released a long silk thread, they let go and get carried by the wind. And, and little is known about how they decide to land, but basically they can travel up to 30 kilometers in a single day. But, but very often they, don't, they go shorter distances, like 10 meters or 15 meters. In this way, spiders are great at moving into fields. The, and um, some spiders are much better at, at it than others. In fact, um, a, a pest control strategy was proposed in the UK of, of planting almost like a trap crop, but a strip of foliage early in the season to build up spider populations uh, of this one family, Linifidae, which are the sheet web spiders, which do this ballooning a lot, and then harvest it to, to remove that habitat and cause them all to try and travel somewhere so that to encourage them to travel into crops. So, so people have tried to take advantage of this ballooning to get spiders into crops. Um, yeah, by walking, they don't actually get very far. A, a current student of mine, uh, Pilar Jimenez, has been monitoring movement of, of spiders into canola fields between um, field border vegetation that's you know, not, not planted, just trees or, or grass, and um, what moves out of that into canola fields. Uh, by walking, and she's found that beetles um, move much more uh, more directionally than spiders do. They the spiders just kind of hang out in the field margins because I guess because the the vegetation is more complex and it, and there's that less disturbance. Wow. Okay. How, how can growers protect spiders? Because in in many cases they're not damaging crop. They're they're there as a beneficial. So how do we protect them? Yeah, I think the first thing is just to remember that they're there and remember that anytime you spray an insecticide or an acaricide, uh, you're gonna you're going to probably kill some spiders. Actually, there's been very little research about uh, insecticide effects on spiders relative to effects on other natural enemies. Um, as of 2012, only only three percent of toxicology papers on natural enemies had actually even studied effects on spiders, but what we do know is that spiders are mainly affected by the neurotoxic insecticides more than other pesticides like herbicides um, or fungicides. And so most synthetic insecticides and acaricides are neurotoxic. Those are the ones that affect spiders most. And so examples are like your ganophosphates, carbamates, um, neonicotinoids, and pyrethroids. All of those do, do have lethal and sublethal effects on spiders. Interestingly, all the initial studies looked at how much do insecticides kill spiders, but recently it's been realized that not only the lethal effects are, are damaging to their function as natural enemies, but um, doses that change their behavior, for example, decrease their movement or decrease their ability to spin a web normally. So all those things, even though they maybe the spider doesn't die, it doesn't eat as much. So, so yeah, I guess... Um, Reducing as much as possible use of insecticides is going to be good for your spiders in the field. Carol, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Pest and Predator podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.